is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 182, covering the week of August 12th through August 16th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to find all those social media accounts, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. You've got all our social media buttons at the top of the page. And while you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. And you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email, which includes a link to this podcast on Saturday or Sunday. Also, download our free mobile app. You can just go to wherever you purchase apps on your mobile device. Just search for Abbeville Institute and you'll find our mobile gateway. So if you want to get the Institute, you want to get our lectures, you want to get our podcast on the go, just get that mobile application. Again, it is free of charge. So uh, wherever you get your apps, you can get the Abbeville Institute on the go. Also remember that we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you would like to help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. So all of that is greatly appreciated. Helps keep the podcast going, the website going, our conferences, all the things that we do. We have a lot of things going on behind the scenes right now. I know I've alluded to that several times, but we do have some things we are working on. So any financial contribution you can do does help us support our mission. And as always, you can get your Abbeville Institute apparel. If you go to abbevilleinstitute.org on that button that says support, click on that. It'll have a little tab that says shop. Click on that shop tab. It'll take you out and you get all of our embroidered material. So you can get t-shirts, golf shirts, hats, golf towels, a lot of great stuff that you can use to support the Institute that, that does support the Institute. It also advertises for the Institute. So it's a, it's a great way to do that. And please rate this podcast on, on your uh, mobile device, wherever you listen to the podcast. Please do that. It helps increase listens. Also share it around on social media, wherever you do. And that also helps us increase our views and gets people interested in this Southern tradition. Okay. All that said, let's talk about the material we've got for the week. And generally it's a, a common theme of occupation. Now, what do I mean by that? We bookended the, the, the week with two pieces on revisionism and, context, and contextualization. Uh, in the middle of the week, we had a piece on G.K. Chesterton, which is actually a really interesting piece. It's one funny line in that whole piece that Chesterton said. I mean, it made me laugh out loud every time I read it because you just, the image that it gives you. And then we had a, a um, on Wednesday, we ran a piece by John Devaney. This is one of the lectures from our summer schools. If you don't attend our summer schools, you miss out on stuff like this when it's delivered live. And then we had a book review from Clyde Wilson this week that, again, has to do with occupation. So what happens, of course, we all know, the South loses the war in 1865. But the aftermath of that particular period is something that I think needs more discussion and more work. Now, we know that uh, the left has become very interested in Reconstruction in recent years. And even the neoconservatives and the right and others <clears throat> have done the exact same thing. And that's because Reconstruction really is the turning point. And when I say the turning point, what do I mean by that? Well, it really is the point that the United States was recreated. It began during the war, 1862. You start seeing some of the policies of Reconstruction being put into place, but it's not till after the war that you really see this radical transformation of the United States. And that occurs on every level of society, whether it's political transformation, a cultural, social transformation, an economic transformation. It's taking place, and Reconstruction was the catalyst behind all of that stuff. You can't get around it. And so when you look at what happens in the South, uh, we'll start with that book review, which is a book review of the Kennedy brothers punished with poverty. You look at what happens in the South, and you have an economic uh, reconstruction that makes the South completely destitute. It becomes a colony of the North. And Southerners recognize this for decades. Now, no one talks about this anymore because you're all, oh, you're just an old unreconstructed, you're just an old lost cause or whatever it is. But the fact is, this is true. And even Northern politicians, Franklin Roosevelt recognized this. Franklin Roosevelt, the, the uh, man who was celebrated by every leftist for generations and still is in some ways, though I think 
uh, he's not SJW enough for the modern leftists. But he recognized that the South had become essentially a, an economic colony of the North. And so that's where the South was punished, punished with poverty. And I think uh, Clyde Wilson does a nice job. He says something in this particular piece. He says, look, a lot of the divisions that are created are artificial in the South. I mean, white Southerners and black Southerners, he brings us up, have more in common than white Northerners and white Southerners because it's cultural. And we're going to, we have a piece that's going to be next week, kind of on that, on that line. But um, these are cultural differences that are going on now in America. There's a reason why you have red states and blue states. It's culture. It's not race. It's culture. It doesn't matter where you are in the blue states. You're going to find a little different political culture. Where you're on the red states, you're going to find a little different political culture. Culture matters. That's why David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed is such an important work. Because he gets into the origins of these cultural differences in the United States. And how they go back to the 17th century. So we have these cultural differences. We know that white Southerners and black... And Clyde says, look, the, the issue is that white Southerners and black Southerners have more in common actually need to understand that and understand that their poverty was a joint poverty. Uh, these the Southerners suffered together in this period after the war. And unfortunately, because of Northern social engineering and other things, uh, there, there was a divisiveness that took place. We all know, uh, as C. Van Woodward, I mean, the supposedly, uh, I mean, who was who uh, uh, nowadays, I guess, would be considered a radical right winger. C. Van Woodward, who was by no means a right winger, pointed this out in his strange career of Jim Crow. Jim Crow was invented in the North, not the South. So when you look at the issues that have plagued the South, the most important thing is occupation and defeat. <clears throat> Without that occupation and defeat, the South is different. I mean, we know the South was the wealthiest section in the United States. Clyde points this out, too. The wealthiest section in the United States before the war. We had a piece uh, a couple of years ago by the late Bill Cawthon that he went into detail how actually wealthy the South was. The average Southerner, not just a plantation owner, but the average Southerner. We, we, people still get this. Well, the South was poor. The, South was, the average Southerner was poor, but then you had the plantations. He, he actually illustrated through substantial work that this was not the case. The average Southerner was actually pretty well off by 19th century standards. Uh, certainly more so than what people actually think. And so the South was not this backwoods, backwards area. It actually was pretty affluent, not just from the planter class, but also middle class Southerners as well. And so all of that is gone. That capital is gone. The South is punished by the general government in many different ways. The piece last week we talked about with Phil Lee and getting into some of these things that, that were done. You want to talk about reparations? He said Lee's contention is that Southerners have already paid reparations. It was in pensions. It was in uh, the way that they had to pay for things that the North said, you got to pay for this stuff, but yet they had no tax revenue to do it. So they're already paying reparations. These things were already done. These are just political statements now to make waves so that, oh yeah, I'm going to vote for this guy so we can get this. Uh, but it means nothing because all these things have already been done. But that poverty, that crushing poverty was foisted on the South through occupation. And so when you look at the way monuments now are being attacked, this is also part of this process of occupation. It's revisionism. As the piece on Monday, Andrew Calhoun points out, it was 1999, a bill in 1999, or a rider to a bill in 1999 by Jesse Jackson Jr. that said that uh, Confederate monuments should be essentially contextualized. Uh, and, and the National Park Service ran with it. And now the way they portrayed the, the, the idea was that not enough African Americans were attending Civil War battlefields, so we need to ensure that we put some things. That we need to make slavery it wasn't really monuments; it was just the interpretation needs to be more about slavery and race, so that more people will go. Oh, well, what's happened? This is pretty interesting. As we get more of these leftist pushes in, in museums and in interpretation of battlefields, attendance actually goes down. It doesn't go up; it goes down. Why? Because people don't want to be proselytized. They don't want to to have somebody sit there and preach at them with self-righteousness. They want to go to the battlefield, and they want to talk about, if they want to see the battlefield, they want to see, all right, the, the army was here, and it did this and did that, and this is how it happened. They don't want to hear all the social issues that went into all that or anything else. They just want to hear about the battle, 
If they want to go to a house, a historic home, they want to go to Monticello, they want to hear about Thomas Jefferson, not the people that labored there. I mean, this is, this is essentially what's happened to these historic sites. The SJWs are ruining them because of interpretation. And it's amazing how that happens. People are growing less and less receptive to anything in history because all we're ever told is all the bad things. People have become very cynical. They don't want to, there's nothing positive about history anymore. It's all negative. And it's all these people are terrible, these people are terrible, look what these people did, look at the injustice here, look at these things. Well, if that's all you're getting, why do you want to hear that stuff? Most, people don't want to hear negativity all the time. They want to hear positivity. And that's not positive. So as the SJW interpretation of all these things, the revisionism has taken hold, you're starting to see a decline in people actually attending these things. We know Williamsburg attendance is, is, is half of what it was in the 1990s before the leftists got a hold of the entire program and started changing it to be more, quote-unquote, inclusive. So people don't want to hear this stuff. Um, they, they want to go and escape and not be told how bad everybody was and feel bad about all this. And do you feel bad about that? No, I want to go see Williamsburg. I want to go to the governor's mansion because I want to have, in some ways, a fantasy, right? I mean, it's you're walking in the governor's mansion. Nobody did that back in the 17th century, the 18th century. Nobody did that, just the governor, but you can. And so uh, they, want to, they want to feel like they're the governor. They don't want to feel like uh, there's oppression there. Or they want to go stand in the house of Burgesses, of course, rebuilt, but they want to stand there and imagine that they're Patrick Henry. They want to go there and imagine they're debating uh, you know, some injustice. This is the problem. Uh, and this is where this contextualization takes us. Right, so you move you fast forward the Friday piece, and Gail Jarvis brings us up. He says, "Look, I mean, you've got all this contextualization. It, it, it's not what it really means. That word context is not context they're trying to provide. They're trying to interpret in their own way. It's it's masquerading for interpretation. Contextualization just means their interpretation of what that monument actually means. And so." Uh, all across the South where they can't take the monuments down. There's plaques going up saying that this thing is all about, uh, you know, uh, segregation or uh, white supremacy or uh, you know, slavery, whatever it is. And one of the charming things that people used to go and travel in the South to see was, of course, Confederate monuments and, and uh, Old South ruins and relics and other things. I mean, this, is the, this was a distinctive place in people, and they wanted to see it. It's like going to Rome. Do you go to Rome so you can see modern Rome or what modern Romans think about ancient Rome? No, you go to ancient, you go to Rome so you can see ancient Rome, the way ancient Romans thought of ancient Rome. Not the way modern Romans think of ancient Rome. You don't go to Athens so you can see modern Athenians, the communists there, uh, out outlining what Athens was. You go to Athens so you can see the ruins. You go to Delphi so you can see the ruins of not so you can see some historian's interpretation of what Delphi means. You want to see what it, you want to feel like you're walking there. You want to walk. Uh, if you go to where uh, you know Aristotle or taught or Plato taught, you want to you want to feel like you're standing where these men stood. That's the point. It's not to have some historian ram their view of history down your throat. You want to see how the people that built the monument, what they thought, why this monument went up. North and South. I mean, we know that the monuments were not built for any nefarious reason. We know from the evidence, the clear evidence, that all these things were being built around the exact same time, North and South, with beautiful inscriptions. North and South. This was part of reconciliation. The North were building monuments, glorifying their soldiers who fought and died. The South were building monuments, glorifying their soldiers who fought and died. The common soldier up to the general. And that was seen as a marvelous expression of crossing the chasm and saying, we're all one now. We all can get along. We can recognize that there was this great cataclysmic event. We've put it behind us. We're going to glorify both sides, and we're going to be happy with that. But now, as Jarvis points out, only one side can be, can be glorified. Now, at the end of the day, what happens with that? Well, if you're going to say that these Southerners are all bad people because they supported slavery or this was a slaveholding republic, what does that say about the United States? What does that say about that? We know in 1776, every single one of the American colonies was a slaveholding colony. Every single one. Sam Adams brought his slaves to Philadelphia. Are we going to stop drinking Sam Adams beer now <clears throat> because he was a slave owner? I mean, I wonder if this question is even brought up. We know he was. 
We know Benjamin Franklin dabbled in buying and selling slaves. So we're going to stop respecting Benjamin Franklin. And of course, we know that at the end of the war, Washington was ticked that the British were not going to return slaves and they sent them off to Canada uh, out of New York. New York slaves, by the way. These were New York slaves. So we know that uh, that happened. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to not like New York or... Uh, we also know that the British tried to make the war expressly about slavery in both New York and Virginia by issuing essentially emancipation proclamations, which were designed to, in, to incite a slave insurrection in both, both the states. So is, are we going to say that war was about slavery? Are we going to take down all the monuments to the founding generation? Are we going to do that? How about to the Lincoln Memorial, as, as we've pointed out in this podcast as well? I mean, with Lincoln saying the things he did about African Americans, we're gonna are we gonna put big are we gonna carve those words into marble on the Lincoln Memorial? Of course not. Of course we're not gonna do this. Only the South that has to face this thing. It's the only section that has to do it. None of this. Are we gonna are we gonna go up to northern monuments and say, well, uh, you know, a good percentage of northern soldiers didn't believe in the Emancipation Proclamation. They were just fighting to save the Union. Uh, they were they weren't fighting against uh, you know they weren't fighting against slavery. They were just fighting for the Union. Are we going to do that? We're going to contextualize things that way. We're going to we're going are we going to rename Brown University because the family were were slave traders. We're we going to do that. Uh, is is uh, is every Ivy League school going to contextualize? I know some of them people said, well, yeah, they are. They're going out there. They're starting to look at these things in more detail, and they're starting to say we're we're guilty. Well, that's nice. I mean, if Harvard or Yale wants to do that, okay. Um, but I mean. Are we, are we going to do this across the board? The problem is we don't. So here's where we run into a situation where contextualization and revisionism clash with what history should be about, which is, of course, understanding. But all this about is about power. It's all about occupation. There's no contextualization. There's no revisionism without occupation. The South was scraping, Southerners are scraping up pennies to build these monuments after the war was over, because they were punished with poverty. They didn't have it. They had to scrape up pennies to do it. Now, what about the other pieces? The piece on Wednesday by John Devaney is about uh, Southern religion. And his point, essentially, is also occupation. When you look at, and, and he, he says something very interesting here, and I know this is a, this is a difficult subject, because the South really is a diverse place in terms of denominations and religion. It always has been. In fact, it's always been more diverse than anywhere else. And he brings this up. But he says in the very first paragraph, fundamentalism is often viewed as the most southern of religions. Yet this is not so. It was an alien seed planted in ground raised by war and harrowed by Reconstruction. The harrowing or Reconstruction, of one prefers, was not merely an updating of the constitutional political order in the South, but an attempt to impose a new social, cultural, and religious order upon the ruins of the old. To best understand this process, the temptation to isolate the reconstruction of Southern religion must be avoided. There is an important, wider historical context concerning the religious life of modern man to be kept in mind, a context that affected Catholic and Protestant belief and worship. So, I mean, that's... The South is the Bible Belt, right? But what he's saying is, wait a second here, fundamentalism um, is not native to the South. Fundamentalism is a northern transplant. And he he goes through an entire uh, process by which he's understood. He actually points out that Southerners were much more tolerant, much more tolerant than Northerners throughout the antebellum period. It was only... During Reconstruction, you started seeing that change. Um, And that came square out of the North. He says, has the wide embrace of the tenets of fundamentalism brought about the emergence of a Southern Puritan? Yes or no? Without a doubt, there has been weakening, but not a disappearance of the older religion is so crucial to Southern religious identity. Not every Southerner, every Southern evangelical, Black, Hispanic, or white, has embraced the tenets and worldview of fundamentalism. Humility is still a virtue one can find in the South, and those who divide the world into the camps of the godly and the ungodly are in a are not in a majority. Nevertheless, fundamentalism did successfully reconstruct a large portion of Southern evangelicalism. 
Yet all forms of Puritanism do secularize, secularize as the history of New England and Greater New England gives testament to this. While the South remains the most religious of the regions of the United States, it is not immune from the rising tide of secularism, neo-paganism, and good old-fashioned unbelief. How Southern fundamentalism interacts with the, these trends and how it is possibly changed by them will, will perhaps constitute the next great chapter in Southern religion. So, again, it's bringing the Puritans into the South, and he and explains how all this happened. And again, this was a, a lecture from our summer school, and John always does such a good job with that. Um, and if you've never heard him lecture or heard him talk, he's, he's a fantastic speaker. He has a very easy manner about him when he speaks, and it's, it's nice to hear his, his, uh, his talks. But certainly this issue of religion and how the South, I mean, even now, if you say the South is distinctive religiously, it always was distinctive religiously. It was always different from New England. Um, and the fact that Southerners were much more tolerant than New England. I mean, look, there was no, there were no Baptist being hung in the South, or Quakers being hung in the South, I should say. Um, that didn't happen, but it did happen in New England. Uh, if you were not a Puritan in the old order, I mean, you were run out of town. Look at Charleston. It was the holy city because of all the different denominations. You had, uh, of course, there were periods of intolerance in the South, without question. I mean, even Maryland was not immune to this. The Catholic colony, Catholics couldn't vote for a time. But in Charleston, you had different Protestant denominations. You had Jews there as well, a large Jewish community. You had a South that was much more tolerant than a North that was predominantly intolerant. And this intolerance is something that's been much more a mark of Northern history. Even if you look at things like race, Northerners were so intolerant. Uh, Jim Crow was there designed with things that they, the Republicans said about uh, uh, black Americans moving into the West. They weren't allowed in the West. They weren't allowed in some, some areas of the free states. That's intolerance on a level that the South never had. They couldn't have because of the large numbers of African Americans, free and slave, living in the South, of course, in the antebellum period. So that's an interesting piece. And then, and then finally, uh, the piece on Thursday, this piece on G.K. Chesterton and the Old South. Now, the thing I like about this piece, there was, there was a time when conservatives across the board admired the South. I mean, you look at Russell Kirk's conservative mind, which is in many cases, I mean, this is what people say, ah, this is the book that got me interested in conservatism. It's Russell Kirk's conservative mind. Who does he have a chapter on? Well, of course, John C. Calhoun and John Randolph. There was a time when Southerners were considered to be an important part of American conservatism. In fact, there were more, I mean, Russell Kirk loved John Randolph of Roanoke, thought he embodied American conservatism. He was the American Burke. He was the guy that was everything American conservatism should be. John Randolph of Roanoke, not some northerner, not some Puritan father, but John Randolph of Roanoke, the Virginian. And so that says a lot about what conservatism used to be. Nowadays, conservatism is, is dedicated to attacking the South as traitors. They're, they're in line with the SJWs on how the Confederacy is bad, Southerners were bad. Uh, I, I was just, um, I mean, this, this is the way it goes. You, you, have to, you have to have your conservative bona fides by promoting the Republican Party and attacking the South. You listen to, uh, to Rush Limbaugh, for example, and when any time he talks about somebody in the South, he gets a very uh, cheesy Southern accent and he makes them sound like a bunch of idiots. You know, Ralph Northam of, of uh, Virginia. I mean, Ralph Northam of Virginia. He starts doing this kind of stuff. And um, it's, it's embarrassing because without the South, there is no American conservative tradition. It doesn't exist. And there was a time that Europeans recognized this as well. G.K. Chesterton loved the Old South. There's one funny quote in this. And again, uh, it's just so good. Um, he, says, he says this about, uh, about Lincoln. Um, he says, uh, quote, uh, Lincoln was quite un-English, was indeed the very reverse of English, and can be understood better if we think of him as a Frenchman. So I love this. Lincoln the Frenchman, right? Can you see Lincoln with the, 
uh, with the French mustache and the uh, red cap of liberty uh, running around. Oh, wee oui, wee. Oui, uh, you know, so, uh, I mean, this is, this is hilarious that he said this. But uh, Chapter 10 wrote this. He said, quote, Long ago I wrote a, pro- a protest in which I asked why Englishmen had forgotten the great state of Virginia the first in foundation and long the first in leadership, and why a few crabbed nonconformists should have the right to erase a record that begins with Raleigh and ends with Lee, and incidentally includes Washington. The great state of Virginia was the backbone of America until it was broken in the Civil War. From Virginia came the first great presidents and most of the fathers of the Republic. Its adherence to the southern side in the war made it a great war, and for a long time a doubtful war. And in the leader of the Southern armies that produced what is perhaps the one modern figure that may come to shine like St. Louis in the lost battle, or Hector dying before Holy Troy. Old England can still be faintly traced to Old Dixie. It contains some of the best things that England herself has had, and therefore, of course, the things that England herself has lost or is trying to lose. But above all, as I have said, there are people in these places whose historic memories and family traditions really hold them to us, not by alliance, but by affection. England once sympathized with the South. The South still sympathizes with England. This is from the book What I Saw in America. Uh, Chesterton also said that uh, the American Civil War was a war between two civilizations. It will affect the whole history of the world. And he said the war between the states was a northern conquest. Uh, this was a northern conquest. Um, And that's why Chesterton in this is so important. He wrote this, That is why I insist on the stupidity of ignoring and insulting the opinions of those few Virginians and other Southerners who really have some inherited notion of why Englishmen love England, and even love it in something of the same fashion themselves. Politicians who do not know the English spirit when they see it at home cannot, of course, be expected to recognize it abroad. Publicists are eloquently praising Abraham Lincoln for all the wrong reasons but fundamentally for the worst and vilest of all reasons, that he succeeded. None of them seems to have the least notion of how to look at England in, in, for England in England, and they would see something fantastic in the figure of a traveler who found it elsewhere, or anywhere but in New England. And it is well, perhaps, that they have not yet for, found England where it is hidden in England, for if they found it, they would kill it. This is wonderful language, and I think that that's the important part of understanding what happened with this Reconstruction period. He understands it. Um, he understands it. Chesterton understood it. And again, Chesterton is considered to be one of the one of the figures of modern conservatism, along with Hallier Belloc and some others. Uh, but he is so important for this understanding of what what that Reconstruction period actually meant. Lincoln, the Frenchman, the radical revolutionary, in many ways, killing what's left of America. And that's essentially what happened there in 1865. Of course, during Reconstruction as well, and how the South was punished by poverty and everything else that happened there. The revisionism we're going through, the contextualization we're going through, the complete transformation of Southern society. All of this takes place because of a revolutionary spirit that took over America in 1865. And it was bigger than just social relations. It was bigger than just politics. It was bigger than, it was, it was, it was the complete remaking of America. A new America was born. When uh, James McPherson wrote, I mean, this is a new birth of freedom, and this is what Lincoln says, a new birth of freedom. Well, no, it's a new America being created. And even Gary Willis said in that, in that, in, uh, that Gettysburg Address, Lincoln was making stuff up. It's eloquent, but he's making things up. And that's the problem with all of that. So the theme of this week being occupation and what that actually meant for the Southern tradition, what that actually means for Southerners, and, and overall, across the board, doesn't matter who you are, this is a cultural identity, a cultural identity. That's where people miss this stuff. It's, it, there's a Southern culture that's in contrast to a Northern culture, that's in contrast to a far Western culture, that's in contrast to a Midwestern culture. Anyone who's familiar with this knows this. And that culture bonds everyone that's in the South, regardless of your uh, racial background, religious background, it bonds you together. And so that's the, uh, that's the thing to take away from this. And I think that, again, Clyde did a very good job with that in his piece on Punished with Poverty. And, and uh, John did the same thing, pointing out you know, this, this certain older religiousness that is still part of the South, 
Uh, it's not uh, fundamentalist. That's still there across the nomination, across race. It doesn't matter. There's still something to that. Um, but that's slowly going away. This is why the Institute exists, though, to try to remind people of this, uh, to try to remind people of how this exists. So I hope you enjoyed this week and review at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day.